Okay, uh, planned expansion and disorderly decline. Uh, you lost the question mark in the program, so it sounded like a very positive statement. Actually, I was posing a question uh, that I hope to be able to defend uh, during the progress of this talk. Now, Adias, we've heard about Adias and Peter Hellyer yesterday, the Abu Dhabi Islands Archaeological Survey. <clears throat> uh, excavations at Sabanias from 1993 to 96. There has been work going on since then. There was work between 2009 and 2012, and there's been the conservation work that Rami talked about this morning. Now, that work, just to summarize it very quickly, and make a lot of statements that, again, I have to defend, revealed a monastery of the Church of the East, one of the Christian churches, dated to the 7th to 8th centuries AD, or Common Era, stone-built with plastered floors and walls of high quality, it consisted of one main complex around a church which was heavily adorned with stucco and with several satellite buildings, individual cells outside this complex. But before going into the detail of that and defending those statements, we need to ask basic but important questions of who, why, and when. Who were these people? Why and when did they settle on this island? Why this island? And why and when did they leave? Now, you could start with a very basic question. Why Christian? Why do you say there's a Christian site? Why a monastery? And why Church of the East? Now, an obvious answer to that question might be, look at that panel of stucco. It's covered in crosses. So that might seem a fairly obvious solution. But here's a reconstruction of the pattern, the entire thing. You can see the scale. Each square is a centimeter, about 20 centimeters across. This is a single tile, which you may be able to see is actually intended to be part of a tile freeze, so it would repeat in all directions if the tiles are fitted together. But we only had three of these at Sabanias, one above each of the east doors to the church. So it's not just the crosses, the actual location uh, of these tiles on the building tells us quite a lot about what kind of building it was. However, during the um, uh, excavations, we had visits from various people, and we were honored with a visit by Sheikh Abdullah bin Zayed in 1996, uh, who was Minister of Information at that time. And he came to the site just as we were excavating one of these panels. And he looked at it, and he said, this is Islamic art. It was actually a very perceptive statement, because in terms of dating, this is certainly made, or at least it comes to Sabani Yas in the Islamic period. As I said, it's unlikely to, that this, uh, the mold for this stucco was created on Sabanias because it was intended for a tile freeze somewhere else and brought and used in an ad hoc but uh, structured fashion. So in terms of all the uh, symbolism there, if you look at the center, you've got a roundel with a cross in it. You might say that's fairly straightforward, must be Christian. If you look above me, if you can get the right angle, or this frieze running around, you will see a very similar symbol. I don't think that's got anything to do with Christianity. So actually, all the symbols on that tile frieze uh, occur in both Sassanid, uh, in Roman Byzantine art, and there's a fusion going on here, but all those symbols have been repurposed for the Christian message. So I would hazard here a statement that the cross in the middle is the crucifixion, Jesus Christ, that the four crosses around it are the four evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but the bosses between those crosses are the Christian message going to all four corners of the globe. The fleur-de-lis, which again is a very typical symbol, finds it, you find it everywhere, is repurposed to represent the Virgin Mary, symbol of purity. And when it comes to the palm trees, the Church of the East was very big on that. Um, in their poetry and in their writings, they often talk of the palm as well as the pearl, which I'll come back to. And you can go to the Bible and you can find Psalm 92, 12 to 14, the righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. It's actually an obvious uh, symbol for people living in desert situations and living the desert life. Taking that further, we had an awful lot of vine scroll. You get vine scroll absolutely everywhere. Uh, so it doesn't tell you that much, but here it's been repurposed for the Christian message of the Eucharist, bread and wine. And again, in the Bible, Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches, John 5, 15. So you can see that lots of symbolism that was already existing at that time has been 
turned to effect for the Christian message. Now, the first millennium AD Christian presence in the Gulf, here's a map, I'm not going to dwell on this too long, produced by Robert Carter, and that shows archaeological sites that have been found, monasteries, parish churches, and cemeteries. And you can see Sirvanias rather out by itself uh, at the bottom of the map. So we have sites um, up in Kuwait, in, in uh, Saudi Arabia, but we don't have any sites if you look at the gaps. Here's historical references to places associated with the Church of the East. And the gaps are basically around Bahrain, where historically we know there's a lot of activity, uh, and also in Oman, where there's less activity because we know there was only one bishop uh, there, so perhaps not such a heavy Christian presence. But there should be sites around Bahrain and Qatar. As far as I'm aware, none have conclusively been proved yet. And there may be reasons for that. Uh, as I've said, um, well, sorry, as Peter said, we were in our third season of archaeological work at Sabanias before we found the first stucco cross. Up until that point, we didn't know we were dealing with a monastery. So if you're just looking at surface um, survey or small-scale excavation, it's quite likely you would not recognize that you were dealing with a Christian site. There's also been a lot of development in the areas in question, of course. Now, I've talked about the Church of the East. What is that? Uh, up until the mid-5th century, there was only one church. There was the Christian church. And the first big split was when the Church of the East was expelled or split off from the Church of Rome, if you like. That happened in the mid-5th century. And east means east of the Roman Empire, basically. So everywhere within the Sassanid Empire, but also across to India, China, and beyond. Its headquarters were in the Sassanid capital, the Seleucia Sesiphon, later Baghdad. The leaders of Catholicos, that's the, the top man after the break, uh, metropolitans in charge of provinces like Bekatria, in which Sibanias probably was, and under them, diocesan bishops. They're often wrongly named Nestorians uh, after one of their leading thinkers. They don't like being called Nestorians, or most of them don't. It was actually used as an insult at various times by other Christians. So why did... Um, Monks of the Church of the East choose Sabanias. The obvious answers again are Gulf trade. You look at the uh, location of Sabanias on that map. Uh, and pearls. Uh, the Sabanias is well placed for the exploitation of the pearl beds. And we know that the Church of the East was heavily involved in the pearl industry. The Catholicos came down and actually inspected the pearl industry in the late 6th century AD. And this number of historical references to the Church of the East being involved in the pearl industry in the late 6th century AD led to the supposition that all the sites that we're looking at at that map must start in the 6th century. And that seems not to be the case, is what archaeology actually changes our view. We didn't find any pearls, uh, unfortunately, at the Sabanias Monastery site. Uh, but could this beading represent strings of pearls? It might. Again, beading is a very typical uh, a feature of, the, feature of the art of the time, so it might not mean very much. But pearls are, again, central to East Syrian mystic writing. Again, with the palm tree, perhaps, they are the most commonly occurring uh, literary motif. Across the site, we found not a great deal of pottery. Um, it was fairly clean, but we had uh, glass, very high-quality glass from Iraq and Syria. I think St. John Simpson has uh, written about that, and pottery from Iraq and India, Robert Carter's written about that, and it will all hopefully come together in the book that will be uh, coming out soon. That indicates trade and spiritual colonization patterns. So from the head of the Gulf, Mesopotamia, along the Gulf, uh, via Sabanias, if you like, and off towards India and China. Now, I'm not suggesting in any way that Sabanias was some sort of maritime emporium, but it would have made a good port in a storm uh, for Christians plying these routes. Location topography. Why choose Sabanias? We're very lucky to have a 1971 satellite image of Sabanias uh, on the left, which was um, uh, taken before the modern development of the site uh, for Sheikh Zayed. Uh, and that's actually very instructive. You can see the blue blob shows where the main monastery complex was. And it's a very carefully selected site. You can see on the bottom right of the satellite picture the very nicely protected natural harbor, but the monastery is a bit further along the coast. In a protected site under a bluff, to the left you can see an escarpment 
to the left of the monastery, uh, and that is actually the start of the gravel plateau around uh, the central salt plug mountains of Sabanias. So a carefully selected site. I can see it more clearly here. The top left, there is uh, an aerial photograph. Uh, you can see again where the monastery is situated within one of these plantations. To the left, you can see the escarpment and the gravel plain beginning. To the right, you can see some landfill in white where the coastline has been pushed out and a lagoon that existed to the north has been filled in. Uh, bottom left, you can see, um, as we were doing trial trenches, that actually on, on the monastery complex site, you can see how close the sea it still is. You can see walls appearing there in the trench. And on the right, you can see the square represents, the big red square represents the, the monastery, and then the satellite buildings around, mostly to the north, some well-preserved, some not, because there have been a lot of disturbance for tree planting on these sites. And to the left, uh, you have two sites upon the escarpment. Up there, we found this, the monastic water supply, basically, a large cistern with a debouching platform and a channel leading off holding about two cubic meters of water. Uh, we think that this is exploiting aquifers in the gravel plain on which it's situated. Uh, it may be that Sabanias and the whole area was slightly wetter and greener uh, at the time uh, the, of the uh, colonization of this island by the monks, so they had better water supplies and have been available later. We didn't find any evidence for any crops unless Mark Disagrees? No, we didn't at the site. So no, nothing being grown on the island, which means that they would have needed, despite these natural resources, support from further up the Gulf. Uh, so two cubic square meters of capacity. Re research done at other similar monasteries and similar arid conditions have shown that that's capable of supporting about 20 to 30 people. So that chimes quite nicely with um, calculations I made about how many people the monastery could actually house, including the satellite buildings. So on the left uh, is the main monastery complex with the church at the center. And on the right, you can see Karg Island on the other side of the Gulf. And just to give you an, uh, um, an idea of the scale, Sabanias is a bit smaller, the church is smaller, um, but both of these are monumental building projects. You did not build a monastery like this in a year or two, it can take decades, and this is a major uh, expansion, a major use of effort. This is a plant, I think, a deliberate plant that needs resourcing, and they must have wanted to place a monastery here uh, for specific reasons, because it costs a lot of money, time, and materials, and needs support from the sea. Now, the church here, seen from the east following excavation, this is just before we put the um, tent that Rami was talking about uh, up in 2010. So we cleaned out all the trenches. And we're looking, as I said, at the east end, the altar would have been where there's the big hole from a tree, unfortunately, although we did find fragments of it. And it's a typical basilica with three aisles and uh, the altar at the east end and a narthex at the west end. And we can work out in some detail how the church was used. And there are very typical features of an East Syrian church, which are unusual for, church, for any other church. The top right room, the house of prayer, is the most typical. It's very unusual to have double doors uh, at the east end of a church. And this was because uh, this was a space for visitors. We don't know what it was they were doing there. There may have been some sort of a shrine. Uh, but basically, it's important to realize that these churches were open for business. They wanted people to come and see them. So people may well have dropped by at Sabanias and spent some time at the monastery. It's a basic reconstruction of the church's appearance. We've done a whizzy computer thing, but actually I like for the purpose of this talk to use this simple model. So you can see the two double doors, and you can see I've just sketched in a plaque there. We had a, a short stumpy tower and windows, very few windows, so it would have been very dark inside. Now, outside the monastery complex, I, suppose, I spoke of satellite buildings, which are sort of called courtyard houses. I'd like to replace the title courtyard houses with extramural cells. Now, what we get is, in each of those uh, satellite buildings, we get this four-room layout. It's absolutely identical at each one of these buildings, which is why, uh, as Peter said yesterday, I originally thought this might be, a mil <laughs> might be military before we find the first cross. Absolutely identical, clearly built to a plan. Four rooms, and I think you could probably imagine you've got a living room there with the windows, 
Uh, you've got a bedroom to the north of it. You've got uh, possibly an eating room to the right, and you've got a storeroom going off north. So all the buildings started like that. And this fits perfectly with what we know of, an, of a Church of the East monasticism after it was reformed just before 600 AD. So what you have is a central monastery, which is the mothership, if you like, and you have satellite cells around it where individual monks live the Eremite life. So it's a mixture of the Eremitic form of, mona of monasticism with the uh, Koenobitic form, the community form of monasticism with a spiritual symbiotic relationship the Ahe de Quilata, the cell dwellers. Those were senior monks who, if you like, went out into the desert and lived alone. Uh, you had to do three years' time in the monastery before you were allowed to do that. And as I say, that kicks in after 600 AD, so that suggests that the monastery was built after that time. And this is one of those typical uh, bedrooms, possibly, within such a four-room cell. And this four-room cell is also replicated within the monastery itself. So we also found some rather nice finds. The material culture at the extramural cells was exactly the same as at the monastery, same pottery, same glass. And we have these rather fine uh, copper alloy, alloy suspension bars and fragments of glass uh, uh, yeah, lamps, glass oil lamps to light the rooms. So the same material culture at these buildings, same people. Now, these originally very Spartan cells were later extended. There were uh, lesser quality additions. In this case, you can see that the, the additions have actually moved the building, extended the building, so it goes over the boundary wall and butts up very clearly onto the original building, which you can see in the middle. And these additions include a kitchen, possibly a, a toilet arrangement, external toilet arrangement, uh, and what looks like an extended living room. Now, this could either be that one of the monks has um, decided they need a better quality of life, or that they have married. And at a synod, the one and only synod ever held in, in the province of Beit Katreya on the Arabian side of the Gulf in 676 AD, there were complaints about lax living standards, that priests and monks are, are taking wives. And this is obviously at a time uh, uh, during the Islamic period, uh, and that many people were actually converting to this new faith. But it speaks of many, many monasteries, and I think it's very likely Sabanias is one of those monasteries talked about in 676 AD. And this, is, this happens at every single one uh, of the monastic cells, except the one I showed you first, which burnt down and left us with the basic model. Uh, this is a photograph by Mark when he visited the, the excavations as they were going on. It turned out to be the, the most evocative one. Um, you can see the stairs uh, to the possible toilet platform, the kitchen with a little plaster oven. And this sort of adaptation of the buildings, in addition to the original, if very Spartan four-room cell, happened everywhere and also happened at the monastery. So in this phase, which may be early to mid-8th century AD, we see uh, the buildings not being used for the ways they were originally meant. The, the Spartan sort of uh, monastic approach has gone. We see rough walls added, creating what looked like animal pens. Uh, we see doors being blocked up, so it looks as though certain parts of the monastic complex were not being used anymore, and you get temporary hearths on once pristine plaster floors. So there's an awful lot of change and additions going on in that period, which looks very much like um, lacking in discipline, perhaps the support's not there, uh, people are doing their own thing. And so the Synod in 676 was really the Catholicos attempting to impose his authority again on a province that was felt to be drifting away. So conclusions, the monastery existed within Islamic Arabia for perhaps a century or more, circa mid-7th to mid-8th century AD, certainly after 600, certainly before 800. It's not clear from the archaeological dating which side of the Islamic conquest of the area, circa 636 to 640 AD, the foundation falls. I would prefer to see it as before, but we can't prove it. Earlier, 6th century before Christian settlements and monasteries, which we know existed but have never found, may be ephemeral, the eremitic, uh, no stone buildings, and difficult to recognize archaeologically. That's one explanation for why we don't have any earlier buildings. And the Christian presence on Sabanias slowly faded and ended with a whimper, not a bang. It just faded out, probably through conversion to Islam and lack of support from the center. And that's it. And I've just got my thanks there. Uh, many of you will recognize some of those people. Who's that person on the top right, do you think? 
who could that be? Looking a bit uh, darker. <laughs> uh, and of course, we must pick out Beatrice de Cardi, who actually found the site, uh, sadly died recently at the age of 101. An incredible life well lived. Thank you. Thank you, Joe.